أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته You are the lucky ones you're going to be watching one of the most exciting sessions to start this convention with As noted in your program we are going to have a presentation and discussion titled Rally for Change. And this change, brothers and sisters, that we are going to talk about, we're going to showcase, we're going to present, is not only the change that we need for America. It is not only the change that they say, yes, we can. It is the change that we aspire for our own community. It is the change, it is about time for us to take. In Allah, la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. The change has to start within, and we are very proud of the early stages of our change. And that is to be involved in shaping the future of America, the, the future of our communities and our neighborhoods. The change that we want to make for the better, and it is best to start with your own. Tonight, brothers and sisters, we will showcase great American Muslims who have taken upon themselves the obligation to participate in public life. And I must say the following, as a non-for-profit organization, we do not endorse any candidate or any public office through our stage. What we do here, we provide opportunity for candidates to reach out to their constituents. And there is no better for our own to reach out to their fellow American Muslims and to talk to them how they started their political life. I am very honored and pleased to introduce four of those examples. And I would like to start with one of our own, Brother Muhammad Khairallah, who is the mayor of Prospect Park, New Jersey, for the last 14 years. Brother Muhammad Khairallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Brothers and sisters, tonight I will share with you my understanding of politics. As I understand it and as I have learned it for the past 18 years, I also hope that I could inspire you to become engaged in your local communities because for me, it was my initial volunteerism that has led me on a journey that literally impacted hundreds of thousands of people around the world and inspired many to become agents of positive change in their local communities in the US. My initial aspiration or inspiration was a political campaign sign that had a Muslim name on it. It was the seed in my mind as a new immigrant that, wow, Muslims can run for office in the US. I was still in high school and I have never met that man until I was the candidate who was going to succeed him in 2001. When you ask Muslims about the reasons 
why they are not engaged in their local communities, socially or politically, you receive one of the following responses. I'm too busy. We're all doctors and engineers. My accent, and that's actually a reason that I heard, and I am a Muslim. I could never win. I'm here to let you know that your local communities, no matter where you are in the U.S., needs you. Our lack of engagement generally is not caused by any of the three previously mentioned excuses. It is a matter of priorities and lack of urgency. For me, engagement wasn't a matter of choice only. It was a sense of duty. A duty to give back to a community that has not only welcomed me, but also made me feel safe and accepted. My family fled Syria in 1980 during the first uprise against Assad, the father. We eventually settled in Prospect Park, New Jersey in the summer of 1991. I decided to volunteer. It would help me familiarize myself with my new environment and also allow me to give back to my new home. I never had an idea that I will, it will lead me to run for political office. So I volunteered in the local hospital and I walked into my local fire department, wanted to volunteer, and I had the following conversation. I want to volunteer. What's your name? Mohammed. Is that a Dutch name? Because my community was established by the Dutch in 1901. Local municipality law at that time did not allow for non-U.S. citizens to participate in the fire department. However, the chief said, let me speak to the mayor and the council and see if they could change the rules. And in fact, they did. So to me, that was the second seed or the second idea that, wow, a dictator doesn't have to change the rules. You could actually change rules locally. And in my mind, it just opened my mind to a brand new world. During college, I joined my MSA and other local clubs as part of student government. Until one day in late 1990s, a fellow firefighter said, why don't you run for office? I said, well, I don't have my U.S. citizenship, but that was the water that fed the seed that was planted in my high school, and the idea started to grow. In the year 2000, I obtained my U.S. citizenship. One year later, I was an official candidate for political office. I ran, I ran, I ran to represent people who are like me, and I ran so I can serve my community at a higher level. When I started my political career, there were only two Muslim elected officials in my county. Now, in my county alone, there are over 50 members of council and board of education members. We have one county elected official and four political chairs. <laughs> On a state level in New Jersey, we have four Muslim mayors. One of them is the first ever female Muslim mayor. Two county elected officials, dozens of council members and board of education commissioners. Muslims now are deputy mayors. There are also members of planning boards, zoning boards, and economic development boards. New Jersey also recently had its first ever Muslim state cabinet level member in Secretary of Health Sharif al Nahal, and more and more and more. It is no longer unique or odd for Muslims volunteering as firefighters, EMTs, or coaches. All of this happened with Allah's blessing, without a centralized organization. It happened through inspiration. It happened through a sense of urgency that we must do this. It happened due to a sense of duty. We must realize, at least for the immigrant part of our community, that we are not guests here. 
We are full-fledged U.S. citizens with roots that are entrenching deeper and deeper into the soil of our new country of citizenship each passing day. I was first elected to Municipal Council in November of 2001, two months after the tragic events of September 11. The pundit said that with Muhammad as a first name and Khairullah as a last name, I was not supposed to win the election. Guess what? They were wrong. For my community, I was not Muhammad that they heard about in the media. I was Muhammad the volunteer firefighter. I created the narrative. The narrative did not create me. I went on to become mayor four, four years later. I was your typical mayor. I took care of municipal budgets, made recommendations to fill vacancies, and received residents' complaints. Meanwhile, I was building alliances with other minority communi communities. Working with other immigrants and minorities was the natural thing to do if I wanted to survive in politics. When disaster struck in the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and Puerto Rico, my municipality rose to the occasion, and we collected supplies for them. When the Arab Spring started, I had the honor of visiting my homeland, Syria, seven times to deliver aid. And when the Rohingyas were fleeing their homes, I was able to go with an NGO to Bangladesh to make sure that I shed light on their plight and to raise funds for them. When Trump announced the Muslim ban, I was one of the main organizers for the protest rally attended by New Jersey interfaith organizations and the two New Jersey U.S. Senators. Remember, I started as an immigrant who just wanted to become accl accl acclimated with his community and give back a little bit. One thing led to another, and through activism, millions of dollars were raised to, for those who are in need, and I became a voice for the voiceless despite being a mayor of a small New Jersey community. See, you do not need to have a large platform to make a difference. You do not always have to run for the highest possible office to make the biggest difference. You just need passion. You need conviction. You need determination. You need to believe that your voice matters and that your voice does make a difference. When I was in my freshman year of college, I learned that politics is the art of who gets what, when, why, and how. I also heard from Co Congressman Keith Ellison that if you're not at the table, you are part of the menu. Politics is not a spectator sport. It is a contact sport. You will not get what you want by wishing that politicians do the right thing. You will only get close to what you want if you are in the decision room or when you have allies in that room. Next year, we have an election where an incumbent who wanted a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the U.S. is the presumed nominee for his party. I do not need to remind you of his actions and policies, national and international while in office. I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm telling you that it is up to you to affect the shape of how things flow in the future. By volunteering the various local and presidential campaigns, you might be able to communicate your feelings and opinions directly with the candidates. By donating to those campaigns, you attract the attention of the candidates and those who are running their campaigns and cause them to want to talk to you. Let me wrap this up as my time is up. It is election where you can't be too busy. It is an election where your proficiency in the English language should not deter you from registering your family, friends, and neighbors to vote. It is an election where you should declare loud and proud, yes, my name is Muhammad, Fatima, Aisha, Khalil, and I am a Muslim American. I am, I, I am here to engage. I am here to mobilize. I'm here to volunteer. I'm here to voice my opinion. I'm here to be heard. I'm here to save my country from bigotry and hate. I'm here to protect our American values. I'm here to vote. God bless you. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. This is what we need. Exactly what he said. 
Let me now introduce a daughter of ours, a sister of your peers, a young American with high hopes and high potential, energy still asleep, but her energy is shining as all over. Abrar Amesh, who was just elected in Virginia, who ran and won a seat in Fairfax School Board with outstanding votes. Brothers and sisters, welcome Abrar Amesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Okay, it doesn't sound like we're ready. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Are we proud Muslims? Are we unapologetic? Are we ready for change? So I'm going to try that one more time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Barakallahu fikum. As the brother mentioned, my name is Abrar Amesh. I come before you to remind us of the importance of 2020 and what's to come. Alhamdulillah, in my county of Fairfax, we were able to gain over 161,000 votes. And that's something that I expect, inshallah, of many people in this audience. And that's only a beginning. Because I want to see many more, tens, hundreds, thousands of Muslim Americans across this country. Not just voting. We're past that, inshallah. But running and making it into office and serving in a variety of capacities, bi'idhnillah. You know, since the beginning of time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created humankind, what did he say? Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. Khalifa. We've seen many translations. Some people say vicegerent. Who even knows what that is? Caretaker, custodian. So what does it mean for our role on, in this country, on this earth, to be khulafa, to be a khalifa? We live in a country today where the average worker who makes minimum wage could work an entire day from beginning to end and not even make enough money to buy a ticket to this conference. We live in a country that's incredibly diverse, but where we have millions of people living in prisons. We're a society that, instead of addressing the root of the problem, we shove our issues into prisons that are far away. We have thousands of families, millions of families that live in poverty, that go home and they're hungry, they don't have anything to feed their children. We have people who sleep on the streets and localities that enforce laws that keep them away from our community areas because it doesn't look good. And we are khulafa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. That's us. And of course the angels doubted because they didn't think we were, we were fit for that job. But it's our duty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us that role. What are we going to do about our un unemployment rate, about health care? Folks don't have access to basic human rights, can't afford them. Our climate, our earth, which has shown record numbers of heat over the past 15 years. Young people who's, who are looking to us for leadership and who are now impatient and beginning to lead themselves. What's our role in that going to be? How are we going to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And how are we going to leave our mark as American Muslims in this country who follow the tradition of the Prophet وسلم, who understand the importance of upholding, in, upholding justice and addressing oppression? Those who up, uplift minorities, uplift the poor and the marginalized and those without a voice 
following the example of those who came before us and guided by the divine guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want to I want to mention that sometimes we don't have a sense of entitlement that believe me in politics I see far too often communities that will sue over the smallest little thing. But for us sometimes we will take injustice, we will take marginalization and we'll and we won't feel that same sense of entitlement that a Khalifa would feel that if we're custodians of this earth, we are responsible for it. And we are just as entitled as anyone else to making sure that we have our rights, of course, but that we ensure those rights for everyone around us, that every community can be empowered and can ascend in this society, that we fulfill a reality where we have a true meritocracy. Because too often we know that American dream is not within reach for so many. So we ask each, of, each and every one of us, let us ask ourselves, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and said, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa, are we fulfilling that? Are we engaging within the community and addressing the needs of our localities to know the pulse of what's going on? Do we have a feel for how, who lives in our community, what the needs are, who the people that are suffering are? to be those khulafa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put on our earth. When our national budget, we spend over $650 billion on military and less than 4% of our budget is on education. What are our priorities and what are we going to do about it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us what? Kunu qawamina bil qis shuhada lillah. And in another verse says, Kunu qawamina if we are witnesses, members of our community, people who see these injustices happening, whether it's to us or to our communities, our neighbors, and we know that our Prophet ﷺ was one who wouldn't rest until everyone around him and everyone he could access was served, that our Khulafa al Rashidin and the leaders that we know from our tradition are ones that put everyone around them before themselves. So are we ready for change? Are we ready for change? Are we ready to be khulafa and make our print on this country? Inshallah, I, want, I look forward to, to seeing many of you. Uh, and as I said, we're past the stage of voting, folks. I want to see folks here running for office. I want to see you getting engaged. You know, my journey didn't actually start with politics. Because as public servants, as Muslim American public servants, when we make our intention sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which of course as we know is the most important thing, we begin with service. You might be a mother at home raising your children and that's your service to your community. You may be a teacher, an educator, someone who works with young people and the future that they're investing in on a daily basis. As Brother Muhammad mentioned, you may be a local volunteer firefighter, you may be a physician, an engineer, you may be a senior citizen who's retired and has time on their hands. Each and every one of us has a role to contribute to our larger society. The Prophet ﷺ didn't keep himself within the Muslim bubble. He served and made alliances with all sorts of groups. And inshallah, 2020 is our opportunity. Let this be the year that we decide as Muslim Americans, we are mainstream. No one needs to tell us when we're ready to get out there. Young people, we're expecting it from you. I want to see each and every one of you out there. Let's hear it for change. Let's hear it for unapologetic Muslims that are going to be out there. And inshallah, once we begin to do that, we can take on this role of Khalifa and we can set forward an example when we know in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas, ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar. That we can be a best people because we serve the humanity and we serve people and we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our obligations to the community. And we live by that prophetic example, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because we owe no less. And so, we look forward with a positive attitude, inshallah. You know, sometimes the Prophet ﷺ himself said, if you know what I know, 
you would laugh little and cry a lot because there is so much out there waiting for us. When we answer on Yom Al-Qiyamah, we have to make sure that we did our part, inshallah, so that we can answer for that role of being a Khalifa. But he also told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-fa'lu min al-iman, that optimism is of our faith. So let us lead positively, inshallah. Let us go out there and make sure every single member of our community is registered to vote, that every single one of us is not only watching the news and every once in a while casually, or maybe not at all, but that we understand the issues, that we're advocates out there for the greater causes that impact our communities, bi-idhnillah. And let's make sure that we fulfill our obligations first and foremost as Muslims before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as witnesses in our communities to ensure that the oppressed and the marginalized, that the Prophet ﷺ advocated for and uplifted and fought for, that those are people today that we fight for. So that one day we can say, the community can look and say, wow, look at the Muslims. Look at what they're doing. This is their contribution to our community. So that we can bring pride, inshallah, to identity. I'm going to ask you all one more time. Are we ready for change? Are we going to be unapologetic? Are we proud Muslim Americans? All right, inshallah, I will see you all at the polls, running for office, inshallah, and making a difference. Barakallah fiqo. Now you know why she won, right? That's the kind of girl. Next, I would like to introduce a candidate from our own. Again, everything is homegrown. This candidate, if he wins, and inshallah, will be the first Arab and Muslim American to become a congressman in the state of Illinois. And he will be running for the third district in Illinois. Of course, we don't count Barack Hussein Obama because they said he is not a Muslim. Well, that's okay, even if his name and his father's is Hussein. But we do have an authentic one who is running. And he is Rush Darwish or Rashad Darwish. Please welcome Rush Darwish. Assalamu so alaikum. Good evening, my family and friends. Yes, my name is Rush Darwish, and I am running for United States Congress to represent the people of right here in Illinois District 3. But you must know something, that I do want to serve this country proudly, and I want everyone to know that I will serve it as a proud American. But please, let me be clear, I want everyone to know that I will serve this country as a proud Muslim American. My friends, it's never easy to make this decision to run for Congress. And when you stand and make this decision, it did not happen for me six or seven months ago. The story goes back to 1967. My family, my mom and dad, Hajj Amir and Hajj Fadi Darwish, they came from a town from the West Bank of Palestine. And they didn't come with this country. They didn't come to this country with the Muslim dream. And they didn't come with the Palestinian dream. They came to this country with the American dream. And the American dream is something that we fight for every day. And that's to make sure that we go to work, we provide for our families, and to make sure that we hope that we receive an equal opportunity. But there's something extraordinary happening in our country, and it's a huge problem. And this problem is Donald Trump. Donald Trump wants to build a wall. I want you to know that I am running for Congress to tear down the wall because we are all equal. We are all brothers and sisters. There's a serious situation we have because we have a president that wants to separate the brown versus the white, the power versus the powerless. And I am running to make sure that we treat everyone equally because I am a Muslim. And as a Muslim, I understand that we treat everyone equally. And that comes with kindness, love, and respect because these are the values we should all have and we should have it in Washington, D.C. 
these values for me came in 1982. Uh, I grew up in a town called Stone Park, Illinois. And this was a town that showed a lot of promise, but things started to change. Gangs started coming into our neighborhood. And my parents decided to make a big move. You may have heard of a show called Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Well, guess what? I didn't go to no Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. We didn't go to LA. My parents said, we're moving to Palestine. And this is where we got to learn how to witness an injustice, how an injustice looks like. At a very young age, we got to see tanks roll into our neighborhood. We saw people taken to jail. I saw family and friends killed for nothing. And it affected us, it affected me dearly, because this is the first time that I witnessed how an inequality looks like. I got to see how an injustice looks like. So yes, when I rise up and say I am running for Congress, it is the Muslim in me, it is the Palestinian in me that understands that we have to make sure that when you are going to serve in this government, it doesn't matter what stage. For me, inshallah, it's the United States of Congress. However, ultimately, we must make sure that we serve everyone equally. Are you with me on that? Do you believe in equality, ladies and gentlemen? For far too long, we've had politicians of all shapes and sizes. They come from the wealth, they come from other upper class cities, and they come into our neighborhoods and they say that they're going to solve our problems. But I gotta be honest with you, those days are over. You know, the area that I come from, Illinois District 3, let me tell you a little bit about Illinois District 3. It's home to one of the largest Muslim communities in the country, and I'm proud to say that it's also home to the largest Palestinian community in the country, and I want to represent that community in Washington, D.C. And we have politicians for so many years, they come in and they promise that they're going to help us with immigration. They promise us that they're going to give us jobs and help us with our business permits and to make sure that we're part of the system, that we have a seat on the table. And for far too long, we've gotten those promises, and guess what has been delivered? Zero. So now, my friends, if we are to see change in government, if we are see, to see change in Washington, D.C., it begins with us. We are the ones that have to make the change, which means we have to vote. We have to run for office. This is the only way we could see real change. And let me hear you. Do you want to see change? I want to share this with you, everyone. Because yes, I am running for Congress, and I am running as a proud American, but I want to speak to a lot of the younger people that are here tonight. I want you to know that I am running for you. You know, I want to make sure that even we're having growing pains, and I know my brothers and sisters on stage, we are new, this is a, a new generation of people like us who are taking this step. But what I hope for is for all of you to make sure that you run for office and we make it easier for you. We want to develop an infrastructure so when you rise up to be the next congressman, to be the next senator, to be the next president of the United States of America, that you will be ready and it will be because of the path that we built for you. Finally tonight, I want to share with you my dream because this is a dream that you always have. It's a vision you have, you know, because you must have the path to victory. You must sense it and feel it. And I want to tell you what I see. Inshallah, we are victorious. And I said we, we are victorious in November 2020. And in January 2021, here is my dream. I hope to see all of you go to Washington, D.C. I hope you will join me and join us. And I hope you will witness the swearing in because here's what you will see. You will see my right hand raised high because I will swear my oath to the United States of America because I love this country and I am proud to be an American. But please understand, my left hand will be firmly planted on the Holy Quran because without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing can be accomplished. Thank you all. May God bless you all. And may God bless our, and I mean our, United States of America. Yes, we have the finest running to represent this community and to represent America. Next, I would like to introduce another son of ours, 
a brother of your peers, a young American who have a dream, who have a commitment, who has dedicated himself to serve his country. Abdel Nasser Rashid, I know him when he was a little kid at Universal School in Bridgeview, Illinois. Abdel Nasser Rashid was the talk of the town of the Democratic Party for his excellent campaign that he ran last year, last election. And this election round, he is running for Cook County Board of Review, a very important position. Brothers and sisters, for the hope of this community and the future of America, help me welcome Abdel Nasser Rashid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hilul uqdatan min lisani wa yafqahu qawli. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the convention for the work that you've done and for inviting us today and for inviting me to be among this distinguished uh, group of candidates up here today and elected officials. My name is Abdel Nasser Rashid. I grew up here in Cook County and in Palestine. I attended Universal School in Bridgeview and Harvard University. I'm currently pursuing my MBA at the University of Chicago. Last year, I ran for Cook County Commissioner and received 49.4% of the vote against the chairman of the Cook County Republican Party, coming 1% short of defeating, of defeating the incumbent. I'm running now for a related office in the property tax system, the Cook County Board of Review. It's a technical role. Fundamentally, it's about fairness. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but fundamentally, it's about fairness for homeowners and fairness for taxpayers uh, and making corporations pay their fair share, and that's why I'm running. I have one message for everyone today. If there is one thing I'd like you to take away from my presentation, it's that political involvement and public or government service could be some of the most humanitarian contributions that we make. Let me repeat that. Politics could be the most humanitarian contribution of all. This may seem like a controversial statement, but I believe we all know this. We've all volunteered, I hope, or are currently volunteering at an organization such as a homeless shelter, or are tutoring children who need help, or helping at a food pantry. That is a humanitarian thing to do. It's the right thing to do. One person, you or I, we can tutor a handful of children to help improve their educational outcomes. And in fact, a group of us, 10 or 20 or more, can band together and create an organization or support an organization that helps hundreds or thousands of children or supports a homeless shelter that is housing dozens of people in need or clean up a park to protect our environment. But if I were to ask you, and I do want to ask you, would you like to join the cause of ending homelessness? Raise your hand. Who wants to end homelessness here? Would you like to have a public education system that's strong enough that children don't need outside intervention. The schools are strong. Raise your hand. Who wants that public education system? Would you like to protect our planet for our children and our grandchildren? Raise your hand. We all want these things, of course. The institution, the organization that's best equipped to deliver those outcomes at that scale is our government. Through laws and through budgets, we get to decide what kind of society we want to be. Are we a society that prioritizes corporations or that prioritizes people? Are we a society that supports some children or one that supports 
educational opportunities for all children? Are we a society that has a healthcare system with um, haves and have nots, or one that provides Medicare for all? Do we support the dignity and rights of the Palestinian people, or do we support Israel's human rights abuses? Do we overtax homeowners to subsidize corporations? Or are we a society that makes sure each, patient, each person is paying their fair share? And this fundamentally is how the democratic process and the institution of government can be used to be humanitarian at an incredible scale. And I point you to the example of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, who when the opportunity arose, he said, وَجْعَلْنِي عَلَىٰ خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ Appoint me over the storehouses of the land. Indeed, I will be a knowing guardian. He asked for a government position in order for him to use his skills and to use his abilities to help the people of Egypt. And we know the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. He said, if you see an injustice, fix it with your hand. And if you cannot, then with your tongue. And if you cannot, then hate it with your heart. We have the opportunity to practice this hadith. Yes, by, and we should, volunteering individually and as groups and as organizations, but also practicing this hadith in terms of political involvement so that we can change society and help millions of people and create a fair and equitable society. Our community has a tremendous and exemplary legacy of generosity, and we must continue it. So I challenge us, the next time you hear someone say, and I know we all hear it all the time, I'm sure you guys do too, I'm not into politics, I support humanitarian work, to say, brother or sister, let me explain how politics could be an incredibly humanitarian thing for you to do. So I am overjoyed to see the rise of young people and all people across this country who may have been previously apathetic since Trump's election get up and say, we're going to rise up, we're going to vote, we're going to volunteer, we're going to donate, we're going to run for office because it's the right thing to do and it's the humanitarian thing to do because we have a choice. Do we want to hand our government to the people who are going to abuse that power, who are going to use it to self-deal and, and to only support their own interests? Or are we going to recruit and support candidates who are going to do the right thing and create a more just and more equitable society? It's our choice in a democracy. So today, I ask you, if you live here in Illinois, vote on March 17 and take people with you to vote. In my election last year, alhamdulillah, we doubled turnout in the Muslim and the Arab community in the district that I ran in. We doubled it. At the same time, there were 5,400 people who we know from our community who didn't vote. And I lost that election by 1,300 votes. So while we were incredibly proud to double the turnout, huge, a huge, phenomenal outcome, we also know that there is work to do to go out and vote and get our communities, our families, our friends, our neighbors to go out and vote. And go out and volunteer on a campaign, any campaign, even if it's just for a few hours. Donate to candidates and try to avoid saying, I give to humanitarian, I don't give to politics. And yes, go out and run for office. So, Jazakum Allah khair for being here today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, you have seen the sample, the great sample, the true showcase of who we are. American Muslims who love their country, who are rising to the challenge. The higher the pressure, 
the more resilient we become. The higher the contest, the more winner we become. The fine brother and sisters who just spoke to you today on the importance of making a change. This change, brothers and sisters, has to happen November 3rd, 2020. And you have an obligation to register to vote and to vote. Your brothers and sisters, they believed in the change. The session is to rally for the change. But tomorrow and next year, and every year will be our struggle, will be our hard work to do the change. Change for real America. America that we know to its roots. America the hope. America the promise. America the opportunity. The great America. America the land of the free and the home of the brave. And you are the free and you are the brave. And America depends on your vote November 3rd, 2020. Are we ready for the change? Are we ready for the change? Are we ready for the change? See you November 3rd, 2020 next year. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.